Steve uh, came down from Edmonton this morning, and uh, he's going to give us an update on the restoration project. And we'll turn the lights off because the screen's a little bit suboptimal. Welcome, Steve. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Appreciate you uh, inviting me, Lowell, to do this. <laughs> um, yeah, Debbie and I live in uh, Evanston, and uh, we've been there a little over two years. And at the rail festival at that time, uh, I had to be here while the papers being signed on our old house in California. And uh, as we as we left the uh, machine shop and, and roundhouse and the, the festival that was going on and all the modules and everything, walked back to the roundhouse, and there was this locomotive sitting in the bay. And uh, talked to a gentleman about it. He says, yeah, we're taking volunteers to uh, restore this locomotive. And I said, give me that clipboard. <laughs> it's kind of cool. Um, I, I've been doing model railroading since the mid 90s. Um, and done different projects. One of the projects that I did was to build a model railroad for a model home, for a home builder. Uh, and that was a lot of fun because it had to be done in one month and it had to be museum standard. So really hard to do in one month, but got it done. Um, so I'm used to giving verbal talks in front of the locomotive and walking around with a group of, has anybody been to my lectures at the roundhouse? Okay, well I appreciate it and I, I don't want to bore you guys with stuff I've already talked about, but there's going to be, there's probably going to be a few other things that uh, that uh, I've gleaned and, and put into a, this is the first time PowerPoint presentation from me, uh, but it's kind of cool. I've, I've had a lot of help with pictures that have been taken by many, many people. And uh, since I've been there, uh, learned the stories. And uh, so I'm kind of doing the disbursement of all those facts and all those stories uh, for people to enjoy. So I appreciate you being here and putting up with me for this, uh, inaugural uh, presentation. Let's see here. I don't have a remote now, so let's just pass you have a pointer. Yeah. Um, so Lima Locomotive Works uh, built this in 1914. And Lima was a very forward-thinking locomotive builder in the day. Um, Lima was the company that took the Shea design and turned it into reality. They built the Shea's. Lima also uh, was uh, at the top with the uh, uh, <coughs> other new designs uh, for power in locomotives. And uh, so UP decided to order this from them. This is a photo of the, the locomotive sitting in a local park on a panel of track that was donated by Union Pacific. So Evanston received this locomotive in 1915 and it was just to be the switcher for that yard ever since that day. Um, you can read the, the different modifications there. It's kind of fun to walk around the tender and see all the different wheel set uh, dates and origins of each wheel. They would take wheels from, that were produced in different cities and put them on a common axle and deliver them that way. Um, the slope back tender you, uh, typically has a little bit lower sides on it, so they had the uh, panels installed to increase the capacity of uh, pull uh, for the locomotive. And you can see the water fill just behind uh, where the coal goes there. And uh, primarily as a slope back tender, if they spilled water coming out of the, the water tank in January, it got to be pretty dangerous. You might as well go to Park City and go skiing because you go right down that, that slope. This is a photograph that was taken in Ogden. Uh, we don't know the date of the photo. Uh, what this demonstrates, however, is the, an earlier generation of uh, uh, Westinghouse air compressor uh, on the side of the locomotive. Um, the one that's on the locomotive now 
is has been changed uh, uh, quite some time ago, uh, but uh, but but uh, that was the original uh, first uh, cross compound uh, compressor. Uh, the other unique things are the placement of the road number and the road name. Uh, the two uh, in later photos were reversed, where the name was on the tender and the the road number of the locomotive was where it belonged on the locomotive. Somebody wanted to borrow the tender, they'd get all confused. <laughs> the headlight uh, was mounted on the top of the smoke box uh, with the number boards at an angle on either side of the headlight. Uh, and again, that was changed through a, a UP system uh, mandate uh, later on. And the 4420 was in that little emblem in the center of the smoke box. <clears throat> this is the picture in 1957 when the locomotive was retired by Union Pacific. It's in our yard. Um, I, I believe I know which building that is uh, in our yard. Um, and you can see how the road number and the road name are uh, as they were at the last. You can see the more pronounced raised coal boards here and the, the fire hose. I heard tale that they would sometimes take the hose off and put a cable in there and they would use the cable to hook up to a car on the next track and be able to simply move it forward, especially if they had something ahead of them on their own track. This is another picture of the locomotive without the brick mortar that you see there. Uh, this is probably one of the finer pictures of, in, in recent times of the locomotive as it sat on that panel um, in, in the, uh, what was originally called Railroad Park, but then became a, a play yard for uh, a, a school that was built later on called North Elementary. And this is this is as as it was equipped as we moved it over to the roundhouse before restoration. So in originally um, there was a, a different section of the rail yard that that had all the shops had a different roundhouse in those days. Um, the locomotives were much smaller, and they didn't need to motorize the turntable. They would just get five or six guys out there on. What was an Armstrong bar at the end of the turntable, and they would move the locomotive around on that turntable to get it into the, the stall that they wanted. Uh, but they had a whole lot of different shops to do different tasks that weren't common in, in many other yards. <coughs> um, they built uh, sections of prefab homes there that they would put on the rails and deliver to a remote area where they wanted to start housing some of their crews for whatever purpose at that location. So that was interesting. Um, did upholstery, and of course the woodworking shop was, was the one, were the ones that built that uh, built those sections of homes. Across from the current yard, across from where the, the, the shops are now, uh, was the Chinese contingency that used to work at the coal mine in Elmi, which is about seven miles away out of, out of Evanston. Um, there were a lot of serious accidents that occur, occurred there, explosions and so on. Uh, eventually they shut it down, but the, initially that was the main supply of coal that was transported on a, on a, a, a rail that came from Elmi uh, back to Evanston and they would go, then load that into the pit and run it up into the coal town. And recently I've learned that there was a locomotive that was constructed in our facility there uh, in 1886. It's the number 815. Uh, there will be some mention of it in the next Union Pacific Streamliner. Um, also, one of the gentlemen who uh, is a mover and shaker in, in the restoration of uh, all the historical buildings in, in Evanston, uh, did an article on our restoration of the locomotive and submitted pictures, and it will also show up in the next UP Streamliner magazine. 
we're real happy about that. He decided to take his uh, fee for contributing the article in magazines so that we'll have many, many copies to sell as a fundraiser. Thought that was generous of him. <clears throat> so time marches on, and uh, with uh, larger locomotives and larger tenders, those distances between the fuel and water stops went from 75 miles to much longer distances. And uh, so they decided to discontinue the use of the Evanston fuel and water facilities in 1926 and let everybody know that they were going to close down the use of Evanston. Uh, so the people there were going, what's up with that? We're a railroad town. We work for you. You, you mean to tell us we're not going to have any jobs? Yeah. So they decided to go to Omaha and talk to the big waves and say, you, you can't do this. You, you're, you're going to be in trouble if you bring this down because the distance to other stations uh, is going to be uh, pretty impossible for us to help you. Nobody's going to be working for you. Facilities are not going to be maintained. You won't have any employees. If you get in trouble, you, you know, you got to think about what you're doing here. And so they, the UP decided, you know, that's not a bad idea, but let's instead of using it to service locomotives, which we still don't need to do, let's have parts rebuilt. Let's have parts cast. Let's machine them, paint them. When they're done, load them on box cars, flat cars, and send them back out into the system, wherever they were needed in the system. And that saved the town. That, that employed all those folks that otherwise wouldn't have had any jobs. The loyalty to the 4420 was huge. It was the only locomotive that lived in Evanston permanently. And it, its job was to move all those cars around, get them into the different shops, um, switch them out when they were, um, uh, when the products were completed, set them out on the rails in the yard so they could be picked up and distributed to the system. So to the citizens, that was a pretty important locomotive. So they they would kind of front load the maintenance on it. They would make sure this thing was running too sweet. Uh, they would they would do necessary repairs, if not before, certainly on time. Uh, we've been finding all kinds of, of uh, evidence of this in terms of the condition of the parts that were taken apart, uh, you know, the working gear and so on. There's a lot that's worn down, certainly. But uh, the boiler tubes, for instance, are pristine. They've got a coat of scale on them, but uh, there's no perforation in any of those, even after sitting since 1958. You guys read this okay? You don't need to sit there and read it all for you. Okay. Just tell your story. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So there was a part where a part in, point in time when they just didn't need all these parts anymore. You know, diesels were far more uh, maintenance free, and and uh, uh, so they decided to close the facility in terms of uh, its reclamation function, and uh, donated the main buildings there to the city, as well as certain trackage, as well as the 4420. 4420 that the city was not interested in doing anything with this locomotive in the day. They, they just didn't have the wherewithal nor the interest to do it. Uh, when, when the jobs were changed, people understood that they had to get into other things. When that, when that shutdown occurred, however, we had some takers. We had some companies that wanted to lease that property. Uh, mainly, these were uh, freight car repair companies. Uh, to this day, UTLX is right next to the roundhouse, and uh, they, uh, for some time, did occupy the roundhouse uh, facility there 
to work on the 10 cars changing out axle sets and, and couplers and doing body repairs, tank repairs, replacing linings on the inside of the cars. Uh, they, they, uh, they really use the facility but kind of eat it up also. Um, but realistically, the, the roundhouse, in terms of its use, should stop in uh, 26 as far as repairing locomotives or doing any major services with locomotives. The key to this is that the roundhouse was then sort of, how do you, how do you say it, uh, preserved. You look at the roof in the roundhouse and it doesn't have any black soot on it. Uh, there's, there's no major damage to any of the brick structure in there. Uh, this, this made it a real viable candidate for restoration among all of them in the, in the United States. This is one of the most pristine roundhouses that exist. Uh, I think Cheyenne has like a little sliver of pie <laughs> for their, what's left of their roundhouse. They go into large, you know, rectangular buildings and so on. But the preservation idea is really lost. You know, we're interested in preserving this stuff and promoting others. Steve, so why, why did the UP not donate the old power building? That's good question. We we uh, are really working on that. Just just last week, we had uh, a property manager for UP come in um, across from the tracks where the Chinese lived. Um, there is a uh, a property line there that where UP has to maintain and ensure that that really doesn't perform any function for UP. So the latest uh, deal that we're making with UP is that we want the powerhouse. It is a gorgeous building, it has huge arched windows in it. Uh, there are some brick deterioration along the crown, cornice I think it's called, um, and, and then there's a cupola, a wooden cupola on the top that is also deteriorating rapidly. Um, the interior of it is pristine. It's, it's, it's vacant and wood, uh, with dirt floor, and uh, it is a viable restoration project. The deal is that the city can buy the powerhouse and assume, which means buying, this unwanted land, uh, what they call China Mary Road. There was a personality in Evanston called China Mary. Um, but they named this, this street after her. And this, just on the other side of that street is this property that UP doesn't want to maintain, own, insure, any of that kind of stuff. The problem logistically with the powerhouse is that its proximity to the adjacent track is outside of the standard. So this may include the idea that UP will have to actually relocate that track. Um, I think it's a feeder track for UTLX. Mm -hmm. So we've got three parties involved in trying to get this done. Uh, but certainly, uh, the Evanston uh, Historical Pre Preservation Commission is, is really excited about this. The other acquisition that we've worked on uh, is the water tower at Wasatch. Mm -hmm. um, the real estate folks are just drawing up the rest of the paperwork. Um, we we told UP that we didn't need to have them move it, but in essence, we really wanted the water tower and figured we'd work it out later. But it sounds like they're going to help us get it to Evanston. Key here is we've already got the drawings uh, for all the footings for this thing to sit on, and the location will put Evanston as a visible sign from the freeway in our yard. You have to look for it, but it'll, it'll be out there. But it'll be high enough that you'll be able to see it. This is this is just a huge thing. I mean, if you look to the side, that there's this roundhouse, and by then you you got to really get over to get to the off ramp and go look at this thing. Go look at our our, our facilities. So the um, in '58, the the townsfolk actually ran the locomotive over to a track, 
by the, the old courthouse, which was located near the depot. And it, it sat there. Again, the city really wasn't interested in doing anything with it, but that was their tract. You know, they didn't have any place to put it, so that's where it sat. Eventually, they moved it to a panel of track um, um, separately. Again, this is a shot of the 4420 park at the site near the school. It was all prepared by the city for as a play site for the kids. Moving glass. Notice that the whistle's missing. That was not removed on purpose. That was an item that was stolen. The bell. Nobody ever could figure out how to steal that thing. <laughs> we don't even know how it comes off. <laughs> Oddly enough, when we started stripping this down, the rear sand dome, which distributes sand to the uh, rear set of wheels uh, in reverse moves, uh, bolted down like you, you figure it would be. The front one, the only thing that's holding it up is the distribution pipes that go down, one on each side. There are no holes in the boiler. There's no evidence that there were ever any fastening bolts on the boiler jacket for that sand dome. It was just set up there suspended by these two pipes that were clamped down to the, to the locomotive. But uh, both of those full of sand. So big scooping process to get them light enough to offload. Did they fill those manually or? There's a tower, so you, you, you pull the locomotive under it, and, and uh, 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 there's a sanding hose. Uh, that technology of, of using sand to dump on top of the rails uh, to provide extra traction uh, is a technology that every locomotive has these days. Still used, very important, and it's most ideal. It's the cheapest way to get that extra traction. So yeah, I've run into folks that have, used to play on that thing when they were kids. Grandparents that used to play on that when they were kids. Everybody get this? Okay. I don't know how the bell off. What's that? I don't know how to get the bell off, but... We'll figure it out. <laughs> no, I don't know how to sell it. I've seen it before. <laughs> so again, this the roundhouse that we have there now is the second one. <coughs> the first one just was... Uh, the out locomotives outgrew it. it was, they, they, they grew in size, and the doors and the ceiling were too low to accommodate those uh, over time. Writing was on the wall. So they they built this other one, and it, it was built in 1912. Uh, they added a, a section onto the back of, uh, uh, an extension on the back of Section 4 to accommodate even bigger locomotives than it was designed for, because time marched on, and, and, and it bigger and better was was uh, uh, what was there? a lot of products coming by Alco and Bolton and, and <coughs> so the roundhouse divided into four sections, an, an eighth of a circle, um, and seven bay doors per section. At one time, most of those uh, slots had pits in them. At this, at this point in time, we've got one pit in section two where the 4420 is parked. We've got another in section three, and there are two in section four. The city has decided to lease out section four to a Salt Lake City brewery. Oh. So this last week, they decided to help us with our needs in terms of leveling some of the rock and dirt in section two so we can place a 20 foot container in there and keep our special equipment and parts uh, and, and documentation all secured. But they are going to actually tear down a section of the windows in section four so they can provide for a loading dock for the brewery. <laughs> Sickening. It's, it's, it's a historical building. Why are you doing that? Anyways, um, 
time marches on. <clears throat> Again, this was completed in 1998. Uh, machine shop is gorgeous. If you guys have been there, you, you see it, it's beautiful. And as well as second one of the, of the roundhouse. So our biggest problem is, is this, trying to drag a rolling cart over rocks and dirt to you know, have tools at your site where you're working. If we had something that was graded better or had like DG or something that was more consistent, it'd be, it'd be great for us. Uh, one of our guys has got some bone on bone and one ankle. He has a real hard time with that. He's, he's a, very valuable worker too. Uh, we, there's light jacket in the winter. Um, the, the place is very adequately heated, uh, and so we work we work year round. If there isn't any uh, anything that slows us up in the winter, we talked about the container we want to put in. Oh yeah, Bon French. This uh, this guy has a huge right pocket in his pants. Because he reached in there and pulled out a $100,000 and said, buy your doors for the roundhouse. And they're beautiful. They're just gorgeous. There's the doors. Um, this is an event that took place about a month ago. We had a Shelby Cobra Club wanting to um, posture their, their cars for a group photo. So the top photo is actually taken with the whole club Standing on the roundhouse is it's rotating. So they could get different angle shots of their cars in front of the roundhouse as it was turning. Um, they, it's really cool that this turntable still runs since 1912. Still works to this day. But yeah, these are some of the purposes that, that uh, the roundhouse and the machine, machine shop both are, are used uh, for. Of course, the rail festival, if you've been there. And we're working away, and it's 10 15, and somebody walks in the door and says, Wow, this is really cool. So we stop work and we talk to them and ask them where they're from, and, and uh, everybody's interested. They've got to stop by the roundhouse and see this thing that they've heard about. Um, so, Lots of, lots of visitors. Almost every work day or every other work day, we have uh, folks that stop by. So, um, first came the restoration of the machine shop and the roundhouse, and then they said, let's do that locomotive. So these two gentlemen here are the movers and the shakers in Evanston in terms of all things historical. Uh, wonderful folks that have a lot of common sense about the importance of preserving history. Not only the buildings, but of course, drawing stock as well. They didn't know they couldn't restore the 44 point, so they decided to do it. <laughs> Again, Von, Von French put up recently about 20 grand. It sounds like a lot of money, but when you're looking at a four to five hundred thousand dollar project, it just helps you get to the next step. But we're very thankful. So um, here's the day of, of pulling it out of the park, um, and of course, just the locomotive fit on that. The tender was a second trip, um, but you can imagine the value of the equipment that that it took to. Get this thing moved. We had some UP personnel donate their time to oversee this. These three shots are the uh, locomotive uh, as it was chasing a, 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 a truck over the overpass in Evanston. Yeah, yeah, some of these shots I just got a couple of days ago. Um, This one's impressive. So the, like I said, the track panels were, were uh, 
provided for us are used from UP in order to get this done. We ought, we'd like to think that whenever they might need to turn something on our turntable, that we can do that for them. Because they tore out the Y track that used to be in town. Oh, we don't need it. For a fee, of course. For a fee, <laughs> no, <laughs> for a donation. <laughs> yeah, guys. Um, one of the guys that works in our crew, and you'll see his face a little bit, um, he works for UP. He works here in Salt Lake. And he believes that through his dispatcher during downtime, that they might be able to allow us to get across their tracks. Remember the property I talked about over in China Mary Road? Wouldn't it be neat if we connected a turnout there and utilized the still existing right of way that goes to Alma and had that be our excursion, pulling our diner and our caboose and whatever rolling stock we used to get, feed everybody lunch and then bring it back after a seven mile, 14 mile round trip. That's probably about 50 bucks, maybe. Is it going to go back and forth across the main line for every trip, or is it just going to leave the equipment on the other side of the main line? No, we don't have permission to occupy any of UP's current main line. There are just tracks, uh, you know, along next to the city there that, that right now, if we wanted to, we could do that because that's that's private. Um, when you start putting anything on UP UP's tracks, you'd have to have. First of all, certification. Right, and a lot of required by why, why the dispatcher then? I, I was a conductor for the UP, so I get right. that. I was just, why the dispatcher if you're not crossing the main line? Well, we're hoping that we can we can yeah, gain see. that right or, or opportunity. We'll keep it an opportunity. Mm -hmm. It's not a right. Um, by making the locomotive roadworthy, having it certified uh, as a steam engine for not just private track. Right. But conform to the steam program that UP currently has, right. as far as uh, as far as uh, approval. Right. Um, and if we can document that, um, then then the dispatcher may be able to gain permission to do that on a on a well. You're not going to interrupt our main line right. if you're going to be at track in time for right. for thirty minutes. My question was a little bit further in the future. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is that, so once you get that established, I think right. you're, you're into daily operations with taking the excursions up at Alamy. Are you going to leave the equipment on the other side? Because it's on the other side of the main line from where the roundhouse is, correct? There's where, where, that, where that branch is. It's on the other side of the main line? That's correct. So yeah, we're you're going to yeah. leave the equipment over there and just service it and run it over there rather than moving it back and forth across the main line to get back to the roundhouse. I think what we would do would be to utilize uh, our opportunity only twice a day, and we would bring it into the roundhouse at night. That was the question. Um, there is another thought uh, that came up um, from Jim Davis saying, let's build our own railroad out to the tunnels, to the kilns, uh, and build a building out there. Yeah. So That's all the dreams, mean. the dreams are fairly. You gotta have them, you know. Yeah, yeah, the yeah, dreams sorry. are still fuzzy, but um, there, there are dreams. There are, there are people that really want to make this happen and and, and provide a, a nice surrounding for it to occur. That's exciting. Yeah, yeah. And uh, tender loving care. Uh, so this is the rivet line. So this is all your water. And then the, the slope in here provides for the coal. Uh, we're gonna convert this from coal burning to oil. And so what we're, we're, we think we're gonna do here is prefab a triangular tank that will just drop into that uh, coal bunker in the tender and then plumb it into the locomotive. Uh, so that's, notice the, the timbers between the car body and the what I would consider to be a flat car. We jacked up the tender body and pulled those timbers out. And they are the original 1914, you can't find them at Home Depot, slabs of wood. They are, it's tough stuff. We saved all that we could 
and basically they now comprise our our bench tops for our workbenches. They are really, really neat. Anyways, we ordered uh, the, the uh, pressure treated wood to replace that. But while we had the car body lifted up only slightly, we, with the boards removed, we were able to walk mm -hmm. under it in the pit and, and check for any signs of perforation. And it didn't look like anything was there. Those boards, they, they absorb moisture. Uh, they provide support for the bottom of the water tank portion of the tender body to keep it from flexing because that's when you start <coughs> introducing cracks and things in the structure. And of course, that introduces rust. Um, so, uh, I like that it's a, kind of a sacrificial lamb, the moisture on the sides of the tender just kind of soaking to the ends of the boards and the boards draw away from the tender body. Mm -hmm. Here's after it was set on the panel of track. Um, this was in December of uh, 2020. And uh, here they were just figuring they'd use the loader to put the bucket up against the front footboard, pilot, and uh, roll it back. <laughs> Wheels weren't turning. They were locked up. Scratching their heads. Well, what are we going to do now? Didn't think about this. So it's that until May. This is what they decided to do. That's when it rolled. Tender wasn't a problem. Until they greased those rails, it wasn't moving. <laughs> and they got it in that far. And getting underneath that locomotive to do anything was just in this tiny area. It was really tough. So our job, our first job, was find out what prevents those wheels from turning and fix it. So here's the guys that work on it. Uh, Gavin Wagstead uh, was a night manager over at UTLX, but he is also the, the uh, grandson of uh, one of our other uh, workers, John Davis. Jim Lacey hails out of Texas, but prior to that, he was here in Salt Lake. Um, he sold metal buildings for, for a living. Um, actually helped, helped design them for specific uses. But he's also a huge hot rider. He worked for a guy that had over 30 different cars, and, and some of them needed to be done, and yeah. he would manage all that. So Jim is uh, current and, and uh, consistent uh, volunteer. Gavin's gone on, left uh, UTLX, and he now um, works on the wind generators. <laughs> He's, he's gone to a higher level. <laughs> At Rick Eskelson, uh, retired roofer. Uh, John Davis um, uh, had a maintenance for the Evanston School District. Nope, none of us have worked on steam locomotives before. Inside the firebox. And then Ken Smith is uh, a recent addition. Uh, he used to live in Promontory, he was an EMT there. and. Uh, he also um, frequently uh, runs his uh, dragster uh, all over the country, as far as far as I know, is down in Vegas. Uh, but he's got a, a whole lot of experience with all things mechanical. Uh, a true mechanical hobbyist. Marty Westland is a gentleman who um, heard about us. Um, he used to work with the um, museum facilities in Ely and was responsible for doing a lot of work with their STEAM program. He came down um, at that rail festival, he and Gavin assisted us in starting to break things apart and get, get the heavy stuff moved. Uh, Shane is the guy that works for UP, that's the engineer. Um, he, he asked to be transferred out of the yard he worked that he worked here in, in UP, 
and took a position going from from there to uh, Cheyenne, uh, not Cheyenne, but uh, Rock Springs. No, Green River, sorry. Um, so when he's working, you hear him honk as he, as he goes on by, and it's again on the return trip. He and I are the only ones that actually fit in this firebox hole to go inside and grind on the tubes. I'll explain that in a little while. Um, but he's dedicated. He's definitely dedicated. So Jim Davis and Shelley Horn are the movers and shakers of the historical preservation in the city. They're responsible for the success of the restoration of the machine shop and the roundhouse and the restoration of the 4420. They moved and making sure that we have what we need. Ed Dickens, engineer the big boy, he heard about us and he was so enthused he had to come out here. It was uh, two years ago this coming Thanksgiving that he just opened the door and says, I gotta see this. Ed Dickens, wow, cool. So what he was doing at that time was surveying the right of way for a proposed run of the big boy from Cheyenne to the Pacific Northwest. That trip eventually got canceled, but he had to make sure that the that the overhang of the big boy wouldn't hit anything for so many feet off the rails. Never been on those rails through the Pacific Northwest. I mean, they went to Ogden, the big boys just went to Ogden, went back to Cheyenne, that's all they did. I don't know if you know this, but the big boy is the only locomotive to this day that single handedly can pull 100 cars uh, to Cheyenne. Uh, there's a grade. I don't remember the grade. 3.25. I'm sorry? 3.25. I don't remember the location. Uh, Her Sherman. 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 It's the only locomotive that has ever pulled 100 cars up Sherman here on the hill by itself. Today's diesels can't do that. That's just amazing to me. I may be empty spine cars. I don't know what I, was gonna ask. <laughs> I don't know, but that's that's its <laughs> reputation. But it's so cool. And then uh, the the big guru, Steve Lee, um, the former head of the steam program in Cheyenne, uh, who was responsible for restoration a lot of the UP varnish that had in the program. Um, he's he's a guy that's so full of information, but at the same time, uh, he's extremely encouraging. Just do it, guys. Just take it apart. Just open it up. You'll find out. You'll know when you get there. Uh, we had a donation of a, a compact disc that has all of the original drawings of this locomotive for the construction of the locomotive. All the ones that have been superseded, those new files that included the, the modifications to the parts and so on. We were lucky to have all of that. So we quick made copies and handed them out to everybody working on this thing. And that was because of the uh, big boy. No. All, all of those discs were because of restoring the big boy. Oh, the UPS HS decided to do those discs because of that. Good to know. Good to know. This is my first presentation. <laughs> so I, I, I can't believe how daily or weekly I get new stuff coming at me about the history. And it's so, so fun. I think this is Mike. John Ramage. I'm sorry, who? John Ramage. John, can you tell me? I don't know how he Well, I've had for all contract driver. He used to be out of Cheyenne. Oh, okay. He used to, he, he rebuilt 618 in Eber. Oh, okay. He was the chief mechanical officer. Okay. <coughs> anyway, he, he heard about us and decided he wanted to come and visit and so on. I don't know who that guy is. Um, but we do get about every three or four weeks, we'll get a classroom of kids. The teachers decide this is a worthy history lesson and they come and look at it. What do they call it? STEM also? You know, all that. To, they can learn about old technology that really does translate into what we're doing today. Uh, these are some of the other. Um, Folks that we don't know that came on the first day to start tearing things apart. So I can't name them. 
Thank you for that. I'll, I'll get the name of that guy later on. So I can... Good. Okay, here's a photo from when they finally shoved it in. You can see the rail bolted to the pit from the outside. And uh, this is when we finally got it into, into the roundhouse with the motor. That didn't have, that had some consequences to it. Could it flatten the motor at all? Huh? Did it flatten the drivers at all? No, because of the grease, but yeah, the, 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 the brackets for the footboards, the fireman's side got bent back. I got some photos of that. Um, this is this is as we disconnected the main rod uh, between the crosshead and the and the, the rear driver. You can see the, the longer pin back here that it would connect to. There's another connecting rod here that goes to the, the second axle from from the first. We didn't know which of those axles were or all of them were holding up or the rolling of the axles trying to get it into the roundhouse. So you just start tearing stuff apart, start looking, find out where your problem is. Um, notice the crack in the G plate here that supports the, the lower bar of the crosshead guides. Here's that crack on this other side. We knew that was going to be a problem. Eventually what we did was to, uh, when we got everything apart was to undo all these bolts up here and the, the G plate actually rides on a little shelf so it can slide in and out and that, that helped us you know get it moved and supported where we could actually take it off but in the process of doing that we set it down and the lower part of that G plate just broke right off being that it's cast the only way you can fix that is if you use silver welding rod and you set it up in a, a jig because it has a great deal of relationship to do with the center of the drive piston. Uh, I think if you visit Hebrew and look in the shops, they've got one locomotive in there. I think it's on the right hand side. It's got a wire that goes from the center bore of the drive cylinder all the way to the back of the locomotive to establish a dead center for that piston and the shaft that it connects to. Because if you don't do that, now the piston plate is going to you know, move, move uh, not evenly. It would be a problem. So this <coughs> is called a crosshead shoe. And um, there, see that U-shaped device? Well, that sits and surrounds the bottom of this upper guide. And then there's another one down here that faces down and surrounds the lower guide. So these, these shoes have got little notches cut in them every so often, and they're placed at the guide bar, and then liquid babbit is poured into it and fills in all the cavities. And the babbit's the sacrificial lamb or the friction surface that travels along the guide, it's replaceable, easily replaceable, and so on. So when we took off the top shoe, um, this is what we found underneath where the babbit was. Water, the rainwater had gotten in underneath the babbit and started to provide rust in the surface inside the shoe, and that rust just kept on expanding, and that is what pinched against the rails, uh, against the uh, uh, crosshead guides and prevented the locomotive from rolling. Okay, I have to ask, what is Babbitt? Babbitt is, um, is, is an old time technology that back, back in the day, um, Model T's, um, Babbitt was poured in connecting rods as a bearing surface. It was liquid, so it could chase out any of the air or some particles that might be in there. And uh, it was, it was poured in a, a mold or a form, and then it was hand scraped wherever there was interference. Do you know what it's made from? Do you know it's made from? Uh, I, I believe, uh, currently I believe it's an alloy, but the uh, major components lead. So you have, oh, really? okay. yeah. We, um, we set the shoe in a vise once all this stuff is on that. You can see the, the, the notches in the, in the shoe casting here and here. These are kind of like dovetail grooves 
So once it, once it was poured in there, these dovetails would prevent any of that metal from moving around. A lot of vibration, a lot of heavy weight. And, and so it stayed put between it. See, it, it would form a complete wall against the side of that crosshair guide. But once that was done, then we got our big rosebud out. We started melting what was in those pockets, in those dovetails, and got it to run out into liquid. So it would be piles of rabbits. <laughs> Like we poured out that from that from that project. We've got them all done. Um, one of the cross heads has got a, an ear broken off of it, but we've got to decide what we're going to do with that problem. And here's where we're prying that that uh, uh, shoe out from where it normally mounts to the cross head uh, as it surrounds the lower guide. The tender. Um, basically, these are regular old Bettendorf trucks uh, with the uh, service doors on them. And we pulled out the matting or batting that used to be in there, cloth batting. And it has a, a, a bearing in it that's maybe a fourth of a circle. The axle sits on it, the tender sits on the axle with that bearing in between. So if you just put a bottle jack underneath the truck, the wheel set stays on the track and you can create a space and you can pull that bearing out and have a look at it and, and determine what kind of condition it's in. You can mic the axle, see, see if it's worn down. So we did that. Each one of these are a, a kind of a, a tub, if you will, that holds the lubrication. So we cleaned all eight of those journals out and set it all in there with some grease on the, on the bearings and set it back down. Okay, so now what are we going to do about batting? Well, let's see, we tried uh, Joanne's, we tried Hobby Lobby. <laughs> and uh, so what we decided to do in, in all eight journals, we have a total of 250 t-shirts. <coughs> we packed them in there and then we started adding oil. Got them full to the bottom of the journal box, full of oil. Came back the next day, can't see them. As the oil is wicked into the t-shirts and surrounds the journal and the bearings with oil applied to that axle. So refill again, wait for it to wick until it stays at that journal box level. So did you guys just go to Walmart with a cart, fill it up with t-shirts and go up to the cashier? No, no, we asked for a donation. <laughs> so we've got a couple brackets on the fireman side. Um, this one held a uh, uh, re-railer. And then there's this one and another one just beyond the picture, a uh, little hook. And that was for a long pole. And that pole was utilized with the um, a little feature in the corner of the frame. It was kind of like a, a divot, if you will. The pole was set in there, and the other end of the pole would push on a car on the next track to shut it down the track so that the locomotive didn't have to change tracks to move. That worked fine until somebody forgot to release the brakes and the car didn't want to move. Come on back, George, I got it. There's quite a few fatal fatalities with the use of that, so it was, I think it was outlawed after World War II. But, it, but the, the corner that, that it fits in is right here, kind of in the, what you might think of as a bumper. Pulling pocket, that's what it's called. So here's where they started taking off the, 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 the boiler cover in the front, and here's where they were heating up the bracket for the footboard and bending it back into, into place. Now you can see what happened when the loader pushed on it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. Well, he deserved it. He, he did, he's done a lot of stuff. But here's the chimney inside of the smoke box for the, for the steam and smoke that goes out the top. Um, kind of a visual inspection window there. We have a draft tube that comes up through this structure here um, for fresh air to come in. Um, 
And then this pipe here is one that allows compressed air, or, or either from the, the locomotive itself, but usually outside air, in order to create that draft going up the, the chimney there, in order to draw the air from the firebox through the tubes. So it, 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 it was the initial draft. And once it started, you know, then you're done. It's, it's like starting a, starting a fire in your fireplace in your cabin. If you don't open the front door when you light it up, you're gonna have a cabin full of smoke. It's just no draft. Same thing here. You wanna, you wanna warm up that locomotive boiler uh, quite evenly. Okay, so we're heating up water. This is a tea kettle, and we're transferring heat through 133 12 foot long, two inch diameter tubes, as well as 21 five inch tubes that are also 12 feet long. So this is with approximately half of the tubes gone. Basically, we start the the, the wall that the tubes attach to at each end. You have a firebox. It's called a sheet and a smoke box sheet, not a, not a wall, per se. We call them sheets. And so the, the pipes are longer than this distance and they protrude out slightly. What they do is they then swedge the pipe or ex expand it so that it fits tight against the hole that the pipe has gone through. And when that's done, then they deed the pipe as it comes out. There's a machine that actually bends the end of the pipe around 180 degrees, so it's tight against the surface of that, that sheet. In the firebox, they add one more procedure, and that is they actually weld that bead to the surface of the uh, machine. So here you can see some of these have got the, the beading done to them, and here's one where the five inch tube has been removed. There's a couple here that have been removed. Uh, we found uh, ferrules or, or metal gaskets that existed between the outside of the tube and the inside of the hole on the sheet uh, at the smoke box end. What that means is that as the, the boiler starts to expand or contract, the tubes are certain not to leak any of the heat from the firebox because they're welded. But at the other end, the tube can actually slide slightly. And that's because this boiler breathes at different temperatures and pressures. Um, this is a grinding procedure, not a, a welding procedure performed by Ken while he's down inside the boiler between the sheets. So here you can see the, the five inch tubes, these two here, and these three are the two inch tubes. And basically, we build up the steam between the sheets in this area because the pipes are surrounded by water. The steam comes to the top, and up here is where the steam valve is, where the steam valve is, is here. Um, and that allows the, the steam to go down inside this feed pipe to a large manifold in front. And at that manifold, tubes are, are connected that go back and forth inside the five inch <coughs> tubes. And this is a twice baked potato. We've already created the steam, and now we're going to superheat the steam. So this run of pipes here, these are called superheated tubes. And uh, you'll get, a, you'll see a picture of how uh, those connect in the next slide here. Oh, oh, there they are. There they are. So one of these is the pipe that's collecting the steam up here from the manifold, and the other one is the return going back into the manifold after the steam has been heated. And from here, it goes into the two large snorkels that go down to the valves and the cylinders. That would be these. There's our collection of superheater tubes once they've been removed. So, so each, each pair of these is an in and an out. They go back and forth four times before they the steam comes out and it exhausts the coil. So here's some T-bolt slots in the top that actually hold all those tubes 
to the manifold, and it's kind of hard to see, but all the ports are in between those. There are three rows of two to each one to represent. The upper one goes to the closest, the middle one goes to the middle pair of ports, and the one on the bottom goes to the one that's closest to us. Again, intake and exhaust. Here's our supply of 133 brand new two inch tubes delivered from a welding school in Oklahoma. $17,000 including transportation, which was $4,000. It was one of those <coughs> flatbed arrangements that the guy decided to haul with a, with a pickup truck. Nice. $4,000. Okay, so with the steam valve removed out of the steam dome, um, this is how you get down into the space between the boiler sheets. You see. Again, there's there's some of us that can do this and some of us that can't. Here's the, where the whistle mounts. The bell, and between the bell and the and the, and the uh, exhaust here uh, would normally be the uh, front sanding bell. We had just a platform that's set up in front of the front of the boiler, and we just use a ladder to get up on that. Again, a good purpose for those boards were removed out of the tender. So this is the steam valve right here. And basically it has a cylinder inside. It has a lot of ports in it. And when the <clears throat> engineer pulls back on the, the throttle rod, it raises that, that cylinder up in this chamber and the steam that's at the top of the dome goes down inside of it. Um, the steam then turns the corner down here to the flange, it turns another corner, and goes to the front of the rubber motor. The cool thing about this is that it has a tapered surface at the top of that cylinder, right here, and then there's another tapered surface at the bottom. So both of those have to close exactly together. If not, one will cause a leak and level. <coughs> so we had to hand lap those surfaces in until we started seeing a pattern of the lapping compound burnish into that surface and then of course continue it until it was present all the way around as well as going from a, a single line to the full width of the seat where the valve was seated against the, its uh, com component sur uh, surface. We did that over and over and over, oiling one and lapping the other and oiling the other and lapping the other until the, they completely uh, concentric, if you will. And that's just all thread. <laughs> we just welded some all thread to it. You can come up with ways to do this. This is the reverser. Um, this, is, um, this is a device that controls all of those valve uh, linkages that are on the side of the locomotive. Uh, and the smaller linkage bars and so on that control direction of the locomotive, as well as the percentage of steam that goes into the cylinder. Uh, basically, at this end, there's a, there's a plate. There are two seals that oppose each other, so it keeps air pressure on one side, air pressure on the other. And uh, that travels inside of this cylinder. And there's a little slide valve that fits right here that takes the air and decides how much air is going in that port or how much air is going in that part. And this is the device that um, is controlled by a term you guys probably know. It's called a Johnson bar. Big bicycle grip type of bar. This thing has teeth, nine teeth for every inch. Just, and it's a 90 degree. So it, it has very fine control of steam injection uh, based on whether or not you've got one empty car or 25 cars full of coal load at a dead start. You want to inject quite a bit to get that big load moving. If you're going 25 miles an hour and you've got one empty car, you can pretty much back that thing off. So the center of this is neutral. Um, this would be the reverse position, and this would be the forward position. How do you keep the dirt out of the engine work? Well, that's, that's sitting right next to the engineer. It's his responsibility. It's not outside the locomotive, it's inside no, no, the engine. You, you, you showed the, um, the, what was it, the piston reverser? 
Yeah. Oh yeah. No, it's it's, and I'll show you here uh, in just a second. Um, so here's a stand that that Gavin built us, Allison Channel. Uh, if you look at it, it's it's a stand to to mount parts on, but then he put a couple of legs on this end, and now then it becomes a table. So it's real handy for for us to use. Um, this is a picture of me heating up a wrench and fitting it to fit in a particular uh, location. But here's where our co cross compound compressor is bolted to the stand. So we make our own tools once in a while. Down here is where the reverser ended up mounted. So we can work on that above the dirt. Um, and in fact, operated the reverser with our with our shop compressor there. Um, and it did everything it's supposed to do, uh, even without replacing the piston seals in it. They, they were not in too bad shape, but certainly we want them uh, new. Here's the compressor as a, the loader pulled it off of the side of the locomotive for us. Where do you want to put this thing? Well, this put out a couple of railroad tunnels. Um, but we found a tag on, on, the, on the, the head of this locomotive that gave a rebuild date. Five years before the thing was retired in 57. We're going, yay. So uh, we're happy about that and interested to find out what, what, what would be inside. And the general condition of this was, was really pristine inside. Uh, surface rust certainly has been sitting for so long. Uh, this little slot in here engages a piston that goes up and actuates all the valving up above. So it's a piston operator. Kind of cool, we've never seen that before. And uh, so yeah, just uh, replace the copper gasket. It's kind of like a, any copper head gasket you might see in the engine. Uh, this is produced by Westinghouse. And again, this, this was a second, uh, this was an upgrade from the original uh, compressor, very similar. Uh, so this is a, just a view of the driver tire. Just fantastic. Nice tapered shape. Uh, I would say 50% of the rail cars out there today have a profile that looks way worse than that. So the, the wheels on the tender and the, the wheels on the drivers are all really, really nice. They're, they're just perfect. We were so happy about that. Um, then the boiler itself um, has a, the part where, the, where, the, where you uh, heat up your fuel. It will be, like I said, oil injection. But that room that you see Shane in there um, is suspended uh, inside of the outside jacket. And there are what they call staples that create an airspace between the room and the outside jacket. And that helps retain some of the heat uh, in, in here. But each one of these staples have to be checked. Uh, basically, <clears throat> there's a, a certain dimension of drill that you can put down through the hole of, of this type of stable, and uh, whether you draw anything out or not uh, suggests deterioration. Uh, if, if, if it goes all the way through, uh, then, then the stable is bad. There's over a thousand of those stables in, in the in all sort, sorts of positions in, in the firebox. Um, these on the roof here are about yay long and support the, the crown of the, of the firebox. Um, there are some that look like big nuts. They, those are actually covers and there's a screw inside there. And the, to, test, to test that is an audible test. A trained ear, you hit on that, they can tell whether that staple is broken or not or compromised because it has a different ring to it. One of our gentlemen knows how to do that. Okay, so here's here's what we're looking at in the future. We're almost done, guys. <laughs> a lot of bra brass, a lot of bronze, expensive press processes and honing all the different um, linkages for the drive wheels as well as the valving and so on. Our five inch tubes 
come in as a, a, a certain diameter and we need the supplier to actually squedge those down to the smaller diameter uh, where the end of that connects to the firebox sheet. The reason that it's bigger in the smoke box sheet is because the superheater tubes go in. The reason that it's smaller in the firebox sheet is so that there's more material in between each of those five inch tubes. There's more surface area for, for that, that could break down in the sheet to form the tube. If they're, if they're, if they're far away from each other, then, then it's, uh, it's, it's a much better design. <coughs> brake cylinders are ready to go. We're looking for brake shoes. And what, we, what are the material of the brake shoes? Uh, I, I really don't know. Um, I would not be surprised if they're they're very much like um, truck applications. The, the, the brake shoes today are the same as the trucks. Yeah. <coughs> so yeah, uh, oil burning. Um, don't have to worry about people from California. Um, and, and then, you know, Craig you can send their customers over to us to donate their oil. We'll, we'll have some, we'll create a tank over there that we can collect waste oil from vehicle oil changes. I think we're burning that. Very economical. Uh, this was something I learned uh, about having to treat, treat the oil. Treat them with what? Um, distilled. Like, distilled. Just distilled. Just distilled. Yeah, you would, you would, you would yeah. take it's all the particles out of it. Yeah. So one of us is going to have to do this. We don't know who yet. But we do need to establish this relationship with the FRA for all the certifications and the inspections and certifications we need to, to keep in our documentation. There is not a, a certified boiler inspector in the state of Wyoming. Is that right? Yeah. Now that's. You're that's, missing an H in the last set. What's that? You're missing an H in the last wow. set. Yes. Thank you. I think I can do that right now. Um, but yeah, we do have a, uh, a converted uh, crew diner. Um, and of course, our cook with the booze. Um, the problem that we have with the crew diner is that, that that was really unique. They had some different thinking back then. What they did in this diner was to pour a concrete floor nice. for comfort. They didn't want to see the water <coughs> jiggle in the drinking glasses. They had to use special trucks under this car in order to accommodate that extra weight. UPHS, the Historical Society, says, we need those trucks. And the city folks says, come get them. So they brought out some four axle trucks and put underneath it. So we have to decide just how we're going to mitigate this. And we're going to ask them for our, our trucks back, or are we going to completely redo the floor in this, this diner? Um, it's painted up, uh, maybe it's a little silver with the black livery. And I have no idea what it looks like. I don't think anybody's gone in there in a long, long, long time. Certainly want to get the caboose going because it's all the to climb up in there. So we can haul that down the drainage. Uh, finding gauges um, on all of the, the sensitive stuff that goes in the cab is going to be difficult. Here's our website. Um, it is moderately updated from time to time. Not, not like we'd like it, but um, somebody had to manage it. And they're doing their best. Any of you that have knowledge, experience with what we're attempting to do and feel that you could help us, we'd appreciate anything you have to say here that can do so. Do you get in the road across any asbestos in these situations? I can't answer that question. <laughs> no, when the snorkels come out of the, out of the, out of the boiler or the smoke box area, uh, they're used to it. They, they, they put a, a steel wrapping inside there where they pack asbestos um, to keep the heat from escaping uh, at that joint where the pipe came out of the, the jacket. Uh, 
that's, that's all gone. I don't know how that happened. Um, I just saw this the other day. Um, this is really a cool explanation of all things um, steam valves as far as locomotives. They use their own locomotive, premier locomotive that they have in their society to demonstrate uh, great drawings, great explanation. Um, yeah, you had to pass junior level math to really get it all because there's some angles and arcs, a few things in there described. I think generally speaking, everybody can get it. It's a really cool YouTube video from, like I said, CNO Railroad Historical Society would be what you look up. And then they have a, a second part of that that, that describes the, the unique. Wall shirts out here, which is what the 4420 has. And uh, when I learned how this stuff worked, I thought it was such a cool, such a cool bit of technology. I come from the automotive world, and, and wow, this is really good. I was going to say, you never said what you did before. Oh, yeah, I um, did European stuff for <laughs> 40 years. And I, at 60, I went back to the university and got my degree in physical therapy. Um, did that for about five years and, until uh, I had to retire because we were going to move up here. And your wife retired, so you said you did it. Oh yeah, this is my wife, Debbie. And she she has some of our fundraisers here, uh, three different flavors of, of uh, baseball caps, and a really cool uh, magazine. It's an excerpt from a very much larger uh, magazine. This is a uh, 2018 production. And it tells the story about the rail yards and the restoration of the machine shop and the uh, roundhouse. The caps are 20 and the, the, the book is 10. I appreciate it. Question. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, why don't you guys go through the effort to actually pour some concrete on that floor so you can work? Um, I think one of the things that we've agreed on is that um, what we do have is is a strip of concrete that's alongside the rails. It's, right. it's part of the framing of the, of the pit there. Yeah, you don't, you don't need that. That's, that's the deep stuff you use, the jacket. Yeah, but all, the rest of the facility, you don't have dirt everywhere. I, th I think the main thing is that we're trying to screen for the funds to buy tubes, uh, brake shoes, bushings, and so on. And we recognize that we've had no difficulty removing some of these parts uh, uh, for, for remachining or, or refurbishing, and that we can probably manage getting them back on. Um, the loader that the city has, that guy is really sympathetic to us and he's real ginger about movements and so on. And, and we, we've learned to trust him in terms of holding on the parts and getting them in place as he starts to advance them for us. Um, that that cross count compound compressor, fifteen hundred pounds. Yeah, I know how. I and and uh, so you know he he knows how to move around in the adjacent area next to the locomotive with this with this thing and put things where we want them. Uh, and it's we, not windy in there either. No, there's, there's no. Um, there there really isn't much in terms of natural forces that get in the way. Um, uh, yeah, we would love it. Uh, we're we're. Anytime we need to spend money, unless it's a minor purchase, it involves another donation and then matching grant to go with that donation, we're going to make a kind of purchase. So the flooring in there in terms of concrete, we just did $45,000 worth of concrete last year. Mm -hmm. And I can't tell you how expensive concrete is. And for that purpose, it'd have to have fiber in it. We'd have to have all kinds of rebar. Oh, yeah, we yeah, yeah. I, I would love it. I would, and I think all the rest of us would. We feel right now that our next uh, infrastructure project is just to get this container in here so we can protect you know, important parts and special tools that we have made uh, and things like that. And uh, when the day comes, yeah, maybe the city will see its way to help us with that. But uh, we, we basically are privately funded. Um, we, we get a little bit of help from the city in terms of some labor from the maintenance group, but we don't get jobs and money from the city. We're all, we all try to fund it, uh, everything ourselves. 
few donations and grants. Yeah, yeah. A golf club tournament, a golf tournament in uh, June, July? July. July. Yeah. That was, we just had our, we second, just had our annual. second annual. Hole 17. So do you work on any sort of schedule or you just kind of go? Oh yeah. Well, we, we feel like working today, so we'll show up. No. So it was it was decided in the very beginning um, that we would work on Tuesdays and Thursdays from 9 a.m. to noon. Doesn't sound like a lot, but with four guys ganging up on certain projects, we we did get quite a, quite a bit of work done. Um, but I think the, the the backstory on that is you can get burned out. You can become disheartened with, okay, well, I got all this stuff done, and now what do I do? You don't know where to start with the next project, perhaps. But as, as parts come in or, or certain parts of a project get done, you can stay busy every day that you work. And, and that's been good for us. Okay, that counts. Yeah. Yeah. So. I guess come on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So. Yeah. Um, there's a guy in Park. Uh, I've done this before. There's a guy in Park City who contributes to uh, an internet group called Trainorders.com. Uh, his name is Cricket, and he comes about every three months and takes a lot of photos and puts them up on the Trainorders Steam portion of their internet.